This is the first in a series of five programs on dementia. And um, the, we have one in March with Dr. Andrew Budson, and another in April with the um, Alzheimer's Association. And in May, Senior Care will be here to talk about a new program that they have. And in June, we have a couple of artists who have worked with dementia patients, and we'll talk about those experiences. Today, we have Joe Wallace, well-known, wonderful photographer, who has worked with private companies as well as private individuals, and has a series of photographs just on um, people with dementia and their stories. And he's going to begin our series uh, and talk about his experiences and the experiences of the people he's photographed. Please welcome Joe Wallace. <laughs> Everybody, hopefully, if I wave your arms, if you can't hear me, or if I'm the mic slips as I'm talking. Um, thank you for having me here today um, to the library and to the Lyceum. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be the first uh, in the series. Um, the goal of my work, as I'll, I'll get into, is really to it's a little hard to see is to stimulate conversation uh, and dialogue about dementia, which is often a very taboo and difficult subject. So the, the overall, if I can simplify the goal of my work, it's to make a difficult conversation easier, to use empathy as a means for connection and to tell stories of some really amazing individuals and families as a way that we can share uh, and, and have all, lots of different kinds of better outcomes. Um, like millions uh, of Americans, I have a family connection and a history with dementia. This is my, the smallest person is my mother. Um, uh, and that's my grandfather, Joe, who I got my name from, and my, my, my grandmother, Elizabeth. So the far right is uh, Joe had Alzheimer's disease. Um, BB, my grandmother, had vascular dementia, and my mother, she, while she does not technically have an official diagnosis, she's been in a research study at the Brigham for almost three years now. So, so that's a little bit about my family history and connection. And I think um, this, is, this is me when I was, I'm not sure how old I am there, young. Uh, and and uh, so like many, many people, um, we found out my grandfather had Alzheimer's when something else went wrong. He had a heart attack. He lived in Birmingham, Alabama for about 55 years. And I got a call from my mother, granddaddy's had a heart attack and I got on an airplane and I flew to Birmingham. And when he was in the hospital, we, um, and he recovered, thankfully he recovered from his heart attack. And we found out through a series of other sort of got in, you know, he was a very proud man who didn't like going to the doctor. And we found out that he had a lot of other things happening, including a pretty advanced state of dementia that he had successfully hidden from BB and from his neighbors and his sort of social group. And I show this picture because it's, for me, it's the beginning of this project. I, just, I didn't know it at the time. I, I heard the word Alzheimer's. And I didn't know what it meant. I knew that it scared me, um, but I didn't know what that meant to him. I didn't know what that meant to our relationship. And the next thing that happened is my mother and Bibi went to go and visit with a bunch of doctors and they left me to hang out with Granddaddy Joe all day. And I remember, I remember being afraid. You know, this is almost, it's probably 30 years ago now. And you know, fat, Fast forward, fast forward through my, my journey with my grandfather and then 15 years later with my, my, my grandmother with vascular dementia. And this is 15 years later at least with BB and that's my second child, my daughter Zoe. This is uh, uh, one of the last times that they, that they were together. And With my own journey of going from knowing absolutely nothing to meeting um, a lot of really incredible people along the way, not only people with the diagnosis or caregivers or healthcare providers who had so much knowledge to share with me. And I had, at this moment, I had a little bit of, I mean, just had, this is my second child, um, a, a great deal of frustration that the basic conversation 
of this is something that half that millions and millions of people go through, and yet nobody talks about it until you're already there. And I had a great deal of frustration that that wasn't just part of the conversation about about aging and about potential healthcare outcomes for millions and millions of people. And I felt like, okay, there's got to be a better way to to reach other people, to build community, to offer these kinds of resources. Because I'm, you know, again, I had met all these amazing people, particularly at, this is in Charlene Manor in, in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I, I got to know everybody who worked there, all of my grandmother's neighbors, and every one of them had this rich, even people I thought I would have nothing in common with, had something to share with me, something to teach me, some some anecdote that ended up enriching me and my grandmother in, in some way. That's a very long preamble to sort of the genesis of the, of the project. So I, I've been working on this for five years and I've photographed 60 people, 65 people. Um, what, what I do is um, I meet with uh, the, ind the individual with dementia sometimes with a caregiver, sometimes with a, you know, a spouse or a sibling or a child. And we have a conversation and we talk about their experiences, not only medically, but sort of uh, their, how the, the disease affects their relationship with their spouse or their kids or their community and what they wanted. If given the opportunity of having a voice to share with other people that are newly diagnosed, what kinds of things would they want to share with other people as a way to bring hope and education. Um, what I do, if you haven't had a chance to see the work, I'll, I'll show you some on the screen, but there's, there's 11 images here in the, in the, in the foyer. And what, um, I take a portrait of the person and I pair that image with a picture of them, usually when they're 18 to 25 ish. And then we write a, and I write a story based on our, our interview and it's a lot, a lot of the, one of the stigmas that I hear a lot is people feel like once they have a diagnosis that they're invisible and that people only see them as their diagnosis or they see them as their medic. They become their medical status as opposed to the, the human that they are with a, a rich, you know, history and, fa and fabric and relationships. And so all that you can see that some of the portraits behind you are there. I print them very big. And visually, it's so you, you can't ignore them. It's impossible to unsee them. And the original picture of when they're, you know, 18 to 25 is to make sure you see them as all of them, all of their lives, all of their experience, not just now, not just dementia, not just the diagnosis. So it's sort of a visual device to get at the stigma of feeling, you know, ignored and marginalized as only this one tiny part of your experience. So um, please interrupt me if anybody has questions. This, this is, I'm gonna start, this is Mike Belleville, who is an amazing individual. But let, let me start with just some, this, the, the 50,000 foot view uh, of dementia. And, um, it's 50 million people with dementia globally, and that's just who's di diagnosed. Um, from a healthcare point of view, the U.S. government through Medicare and Medicaid will spend $305 billion a year caring for people with Alzheimer's and dementia. That doesn't include the $250 billion of unpaid caregiver work, often taken on by family members. Um, Six million in the US, people in the U.S., um, it's estimated that's only one in four that are actually given the diagnosis. So that's up to 24 million people in the U.S. So the, the numbers are really, it's shot, it's, it's amazing. We can't have this conversation a lot easier if that's the number. Um, and yet, despite the millions of individuals and families affected, dementia is often taboo, limited public awareness or discourse. A diagnosis can become a mechanism for segregating those affected from society, making it easy, like we talked about, to see the label instead of the person. Um, you know, if you Google dementia or Alzheimer's, you know, the, the, the narrative often tends to focus on the clinical the medical status. Um, it's often used depicting fear, despair, vulnerability. This is a narrow and incomplete view, and it, it really quickly becomes a, a, a way to distance yourself 
from the individual's humanity. Uh, by, and by focusing only on the narrowest of views, you're not going to change the stigma of the people that are living with the disease. And, and in many ways, to me, showing the stereotype only makes it easier to ignore the health crisis because you're dehumanizing. So my, my goal like, is to destigmatize those living with the disease, to use empathy as a means for connection, to tell a more complete and complex story of the disease, of their families, their loved ones, and, and their role in their communities. Um, you know, I want to give people the hope um, and, and courage to act in, in ways large and small. You know, it could be, you know, some people want to give money to the Alzheimer's Association. Some people want to work at a senior center. Some people want to just be more patient about that, you know, or, or you know, if you get annoyed that somebody's having difficulty counting their change at the grocery store, help. Take, you know, there's, there's so many ways uh, in small and large to make this the outcomes better. Um, so, uh, so let, yeah, let's get to the work. This is Mike Belleville. And as, a, as I presented this work sort of through COVID, typically what had happened before COVID is you go in the, in the exhibit space and you get a chance to read all of the stories. And what I, what I have done through COVID, I've done the, presented a lot over Zoom, is I actually, I'm going to read a little bit of what Mike and I talked about, because it's really, it's pretty powerful. Mike is 54, um, and he told me, the biggest thing for me is stigma. It's because of what people think or what they anticipate, what they see as dementia. The public narrative is tragedy. As soon as you get the diagnosis, you're automatically put in this pool as a person who is not capable anymore. It's automatic. It's like, pow, you're in this bucket now. You're no longer capable of making decisions for yourself. You're no longer capable of participating. You're no longer able to contribute to society. You can't learn anything. These are all things you can't do anymore. It makes me really frustrated and angry. This needs to be talked about in the elevator, in schools, in line at the grocery store, at the family dinner table. It needs to be talked about. No more hiding us in the back room. In the, pa in the past, this was taboo and scary, you know? And all the words that go with it, demented, senile, Today, there are a lot of us, and we're trying to say no. It's no wonder people don't want to talk about it. They are being ostracized, judged, assumed to not be capable. And it's no wonder because of what people see in the media. I say, I say, don't pigeonhole me. Don't automatically assume I can't do something. This is Juanita Peterson, uh, her graduation photo. She went to high school in Winston-Salem. North Carolina and got a, a scholarship to City College in New York, where she went on uh, to NYU and got a PhD. Uh, and she was a clinician at um, Bellevue Hospital for most of her life. So it's an amazing woman. Um, she, I, I met her at the Croc Center in, in Boston. She had been brought to, um, could no longer live alone. And I met her through her daughter. Lisa, who is her primary caregiver and also a nurse by trade. And I asked Juanita about her dementia, because she was a therapist and a clinician. So I, you know, I, when, I, when I talk to people, just as a, as a side note, I don't, I don't pull punches. I ask hard questions, and we, we really talk about dementia and the effects. And I find that... Um, the worst thing, in my experience with all the people I've interviewed, the worst thing you can do is treat somebody with dementia like they have something wrong with them. Um, people don't want to be patronized. People don't want to be talked down to. It, it's hard. But if you deny that it's hard, you deny part of their experience. So, you know, we often talk about, we talk about end of life. We talk about the, uh, the despair, but we also talk about the joy and the grandkids. And uh, I, I feel like... Um, People, people want to be heard. Um, so Juanita, when I asked her about her dementia, she said, it, it, it feels awful. Let me tell you, it feels like part of my life is cut off and I can't get it back. I'm really sad. The other day, I couldn't remember my husband's birthday. How could I forget that? 
it's frightening that you couldn't re that I can't remember things that were so important to me. Um, I, on, another, on another note, just about Juanita's photograph, um, normally there's, um, when you walk into the room of all the work, I want to, the, part of my goal is so people see someone that they can relate to. And they walk into a room and they feel, um, I have something in common with someone either in the photo or in the story. So I've worked really hard to make sure that I photograph people of all different ethnicities, religious backgrounds, ages, um, uh, just as a side note, another stigma breaking thing is I've photographed, um, actually we'll, we'll get to them, a, a woman as old as 100 and as young as 30. So again, it, it's, it's um, there's, so, there's so much variation and everyone's experience is, is so different. Um, if you guys have questions, please wave me off and, or ask. Um, th this is Larry. Larry was a theater teacher and um, He's my age, he's 50. And this is his daughter, um, Zoe, and son, Brendan, and his wife, Allison. And this is the first for me where I did my interview with a whole family with kids this young. And it was, uh, it was hard. Um, but I admired his family for, again, doing what I'm talking about, which is having the difficult conversation with everyone together. Um, his daughter and my daughter happened to share the same name too, which was interesting. Um, sorry, I, it's a it's a really long story, so I have to pick out which part that to read. So she, we had um, Allison told me we have good days and we have bad days. We take one we take one day at a time. I think all of us have learned to really live in the moment. You have to do that. You have to savor those moments. I savor the moments of clarity, whether it's once in a while before bed. Larry will say, "I love you." And there he is, it's Larry. Or he'll say, thank you for taking such good care of me. And he'll say it at a time where I just, where did that come from? Those are the moments that I cherish. I, I should say that Larry is um, quite advanced. He's mostly nonverbal. Um, he's very physically, he's very physically fit and capable, but he, he has a very hard time speaking. Um, so uh, Allison told me, we have something at home. We have a joy jar. It's to encourage those small things. We made it a point, the three of us, Brendan, Zoe, and I, we went out and we picked out a jar and we wrote share on the outside. We have special papers and you write it down. It's whether you got an A on the math test or so-and-so made you smile today. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It's the little things that make you smile or make you happy and you put it in the jar. And then when you have a bad day, we come in and we take them out of the jar and we read them. Um, the, 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 there was a moment of, of Larry having clarity after we were talking about the, the joy jar. He, he kind of sat up and he was he wanted to participate. And I asked him, is there anything you wanted to share, Larry? And he, he said, I guess I've been harboring a lot of guilt for having the disease like a curse. And I don't know how to come to terms with it. He said, um, I said, that's okay, take your time. Are you, are you, do you think about your father? His father died His father died of Alzheimer's when he was 46. Larry said, yes. I said, well, well what, what comes up for you? What do you want to tell me? And he said, I couldn't, I couldn't help him. I know it's not rational. I couldn't do anything to help him. And I said, and I asked, Larry, if he had something he wanted to say to Allison. And he said, I'm sorry I put you through this. Um, I, it's, it's worth noting, given that his daughter is Zoe and my daughter is Zoe, that, that my daughter often comes with me. I, I share my work at support groups um, a lot. And sometimes she comes to photo, photography sessions and interviews with me. She asks, <laughs> she has great questions, but it's, um, I, I think, um, just on a note of kids, I think children are so much more capable of uh, digesting and handling difficult subjects, oftentimes better than, with better acumen than adults. Um, sorry, this is the portrait, this is the portrait I took of Larry. Can I ask a question? Please. Um, you said at the beginning of when you showed that last slide that it was, you know, very difficult because they were, it was just difficult because there were kids there and, um, 
mean, I imagine they're all difficult. And, um, I did some work where I interviewed mothers of kids that had died of gun violence. And I would come home at night and my husband would say, there's no place to put that kind of pain and, and sadness. And I've like, been watching your body during watching the fly. And there's like a definite reaction to seeing, you know, seeing these old, like old friends almost. And it's, I wonder how you deal with this kind of sadness, um, in, 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 you know, in, in it, doing this work. It's a great, it's a great question. I think you have, um, there are days where you feel like you've consumed someone else's grief and it's debilitating. There's no, there's no question. On the other hand, I mean, I'm an optimist, but it, it's, um, it is, when, like I said, we talk about the hard stuff. We don't, you know, we don't ask about, you know, you know the, the color of the sky or your garden or whatever. And it, it, but it, someone sharing something so important to them feels, it's going to sound corny, but it sounds like, it feels like a gift. The people that I spend two hours, three hours with can share something that profound and in a life you know i'm 50 i've got two teenagers there's a lot of bs going on in my life right now and to spend time with people that really want to make our time count it, it, it's you know and i think that's why my daughter likes to come because all the bs doesn't matter and um i'm not sure i, I I, I get your, hus your husband's comment about there's no place for that to go. Where do, where do you go with that level of sadness? And I, my only answer is you use it as fuel to do better in your own life in the now. At least I do. And, um, you know, Zoe, my Zoe and I talk about that. If she's had a bad day at school or whatever, we talk about a reference of the project. Because I, I like to tell her, you know, I, when people are really willing to share, we talk about... You know, if they're in an advanced state, we talk about what matters. What do you want to tell your, you know, your remaining loved ones? And it's really interesting what people say, because it's really similar across the 65 people I've photographed. You know, people don't tell you about what they tell you when you're my son's age. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't talk about their money. They don't talk about their job, their house, their career. You know, they, they talk about their favorite Thanksgiving tradition or the stupid songs they sang together or, um, you know, the jokes they like to play on one another or their family traditions. I mean, to the person, no matter their, their ethnicity or their socioeconomic, back, their socioeconomic background, it's really, it's really powerful. And I, I would imagine that in a situation of, um, you know, even a shooting, that people are sharing their grief and trying desperately to hold on to what matters. Like, oh, that was a really long answer. No, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so it, it is it, it is hard to work on this sometimes. It's tiring. Um, and 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 but I, I think it's I think it's worth it. And it's certainly made, it's given me an incredible amount of respect for the people that do this professionally you know, that are social workers or caregivers, whether they're paid or not paid, because it takes a certain kind of person that can do this 70 hours a week, uh, over and over and over again. And people that work in, in gerontology or, or I can't just think of it, palliative care, hospice and stuff. Hospice in particular, I've met some of the most amazing human beings I've ever. Um, sorry, I'll go down the rabbit hole if I'm not careful. This is Helen. Um, ha Helen is a hundred in this picture and she's a great example of exactly what we were just talking about because she's lived this incredible life. She was, um, born in China, had to flee her home country when the Japanese invaded in 1937. And then she had to flee her country again when, during the communist revolution, separated from her family in mainland China, fled to Taiwan. Over 30 years, she was a midwife. She almost died of typhoid fever. She delivered like 160 kids. Just amazingly full life experience. And then 
you ask, you ask her about her, you know, what she wants to share with her family or her favorite memories. And it's all about either Chinese New Year or their, their family traditions. None of this incredible hardship comes up. And that's what I, you know, and that's what I would, you know, that's what I, when people are in moments of despair, that's what I try to share with them is that, yes, this, what you're talking about is really hard, but you have to remember all these other things in your life that have given you so much energy or, or courage or vitality or how, you know, however everybody wants to express their fuel in some other way, right? The, the other cool thing about this picture is she's, um, she uh, she walks with a walker. Her daughter met me. Her daughter lives, works at NASA and lives in Virginia. And she flew up. This is uh, this is taken at a place called South Cove Manor, which used to be in Chinatown, and it's now in Quincy, which is where a lot of Chinatown has moved to. For those of you who don't know, but she um, she brought the traditional Chom Som dress, and I got lucky because I don't know if you could tell on the screen, but I brought a backdrop that matched her her dress and um, she has a walker and she knew I don't speak I don't speak Cantonese but her, her daughter was um, helping me in, interpret and she had a nurse on either side with her walker and she pushed them she sort of said okay this is my this is my moment get, get the hell out of the way this is you know she stood up really straight and I sometimes I, were, I forgot to bring it but I have the picture before and after of the nurse on either side with the walker and her you know and she stood up like this and then there's a picture afterwards of her having this huge sort of guffaw moment with her daughter it's really it's really cute um i won't i won't i won't bore you with reading the the quotes um this is greg o'brien who's a cape cod native and some of you may have read his book it's called on pluto inside the mind of alzheimer's he's hilarious and really cutting he doesn't I mean, if you think I'm direct, he takes it to a whole other level. Um, our interview was filled with expletives and um, four-letter words. And um, he, he's just a, a, a really amazing guy. And super. He, 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 he takes being direct about the hard stuff to like another level. He, he wants to tell you about incontinence he wants to tell you about losing his way he wants to tell you about his you know hallucinations and his family history and it's it's kind of refreshing on on you know, how direct he is because it makes it really hard to feel uncomfortable because he's so not um, so um, I'll just read a little bit of what Greg shared with me um, minus all of the bad language um, uh, Stephen King could not have designed a better plot for a sickness that slowly steals the mind, then pilfers the body, then robs your finances, pushing families like mine to bankruptcy. Then there's the depression that seems to have no bottom and flirts with suicide. Yet Alzheimer's can't take your soul, so please don't be fooled by the inaccurate stereotypes of this disease. There are millions of individuals living with Alzheimer's in early stages still highly functioning, perhaps not even diagnosed yet, who are fighting off horrific symptoms daily and beyond the observations of others. Our minds, in many ways, are like iPhones, still sophisticated devices, but with a short-term battery that pocket dials and gets lost easily. Those on this journey aren't stupid. We just have a disease that at times, often without notice, takes us down dramatically um, this is uh, Zifang Wu. I, I, I love this picture. Um, she was born in Beijing. She was um, from a large family that valued education and integrity. She was a professor in Xi'an for many years. After retiring, she and her husband immigrated to the U.S. to be closer to their children. I, I met with her daughter, Yuan. She told me, when you have Alzheimer's, you become a different person. When my father passed away, I could remember what he was like up until the last moment. But with my mother, it's harder because that special mother-daughter relationship is no longer there. I hesitate to talk about these things because when I talk about it, I feel like I have already lost my mom, but she's still right here. I just don't know how to replace my emotion. I'm not scared, 
just hesitate. I don't know how to tell my mom's friends or my mom's relatives that she has this disease. It, it's, I just don't know how to say this. She has been a very strong and independent person, and I don't see any of that right now. It, it, it's, I, I think, I, I, I think my, my reaction to reading that and remembering my, my interview was that everybody, everybody progresses differently and everyone handles it differently. And um, um, it, does anybody have any questions while I fumble with my computer here? Anybody? This is, um, I promise I'm not showing you all 60. Um, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Kathy Shaw. Um, Kathy is uh, 67 and she, um, she reflected with me, she reflected back on her fear in her late 40s when she began to sense her mind was not functioning as it should. Several members of her family had suffered with Alzheimer's, her mother, her aunt, uncle, and her older sister. And she was scared. She kept her terror locked inside for a few years before finally seeing her doctor. Unfortunately, like many people with younger onset dementia, Kathy was misdiagnosed and told she was simply depressed and should try therapy, perhaps menopause. You'd be surprised how many times women have been told that. Um, I, I was kind of appalled. Um, despite her family history, cognitive testing was not prescribed. It was not until several frustrating years in switching doctors that she had cognitive testing and was diagnosed with dementia. Reflecting on those first few years in her 50s, Kathy described constantly battling the stigma of Alzheimer's. Her friends refused to believe the diagnosis. People she had known for years stopped calling or would look past her when they bumped into her in town, speaking to her husband, John, like she wasn't even there. Kathy told me my group of friends was always too polite to say anything about it or ask questions. Time after time, people would say, oh, I'm just like you, I forget things too used to make me really angry, but now I've kind of given up. They look at me and it makes me think of them, and it makes them think of their future and they want to look away or avoid me. Even the neurologist, when I had my recent evaluation, the doctor spoke to John the entire time, talking about me when I was sitting right there. I'm isolating myself from my friends now, finally. The stress of trying to be normal and have appropriate responses is just too hard. I asked Kathy what advice she would give a newly diagnosed individual, and she told me the best thing you can do is to find a group you can join, be part of a caregiver group or a group of others with dementia. It's so helpful to be with people who understand what you're going through. You don't feel so alone. She quickly added, listen, just, just listen. That's all anybody needs. Don't tell them that you forget things too. Just stop and listen. If we did that, how much kinder would life be? You can't fix this but we're gonna to have to learn how to deal with it and be okay with it. Um, this is Bam, I'm Bradley, who I photographed in, in uh, Springfield, Missouri. And uh, by far the youngest person I photographed, she is um, 30 uh, or 29 in this photo. And she has what's called dominantly inherited Alzheimer's, which is a a very rare genetic mutation. And um, I, it was really important. She, she's an amazing woman, and it was really important for me to show somebody this young because people don't, people don't realize how many people get the different kinds of dementia at a, very, at a very young age. And because cognitive testing isn't part of a normal care plan, people don't get it until it's too late. And the, and the the pathology of Alzheimer's starts years and years and years before cognitive testing is even a, a, a offered. Um, and and I, I would say back to, to Kathy's story about being misdiagnosed and told somebody said she needed therapy, somebody said she needed menopause, and sure she not needed, has menopause, excuse me. I, I think gets to the sort of the, the stigma of this and people 
stop paying attention when they hear that you have dementia and they don't want to talk about it, even healthcare providers. So I feel like if these kinds of conversations can become normal, then people are going to pay better attention in the doctor's office. It's it's truly shocking how many stories I've heard of people being misdiagnosed and getting the runaround for years before they get the care they deserve, and how different the healthcare outcomes are depending on where you live and the quality of the care you receive. Um, it's, def it's definitely a uh, unfairness in our healthcare system about the quality of care you get depending on how much money you have. Um, sorry, back to Bama. Um, she told me she she uses a she's she's um, she had, she had like I said she has dominantly inherited Alzheimer's it, it's already affecting her speech and her motor control and her, so she has a hard time speaking and walking. Um, I'm third generation early onset Alzheimer's. My brother passed away a week ago from early onset. He was 33. My mother passed away at 34. Her mother died at 26. I'm 29. I was diagnosed in 2017, and I'm going to make it to 30. I'll compress some of this. She 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 started to cry, and I and I asked her what she would tell somebody who was newly diagnosed. Learn to be patient with yourself. I think the hardest thing is. When you're by yourself and you fall or something, it's knowing that you need someone to help you. I used to be an independent person. It was very hard for me to be patient with myself because one day you can walk, one day you can run, and then you can't. And you, ha and you don't have the power to make it okay. I love Jesus, and I believe he has a plan, but it's particularly hard at the moment to make yourself believe that there's a plan and that you are cared for. Try to make sense of it, especially when you're younger and you don't get to do what young people do. You miss out on all the things that life should give you. I've been married for five years, but it's not long enough. I have an awesome husband. I chose a good one. He's really patient and very kind all the time. If he weren't around, I wouldn't be able to do it. There are days like, like this morning, there are days that I can't move. And he'll come and sit next to me and put my legs over the side of the bed so I can stand up. It's hard to think about who you were and who you are now and be okay with it. And I asked her, how, how do you do that? So I'm, I'm still figuring it out. I would say be joyful in every moment because you might not have another one. If you just go to the grocery store, you can be kind to anybody you meet and that could change their entire day. Maybe nobody was nice to you to them, and nobody spoke to them all day, but you can be that person who wants to spread joy. I think being patient with people is the biggest thing. It's knowing at the beginning of the day, people are people, and you only have 24 hours to invest in them or not. You can either make them better or worse. So I think it's, it's, so I think just be good to yourself and to others. It sounds really cliche, but I like that. This is the kind of story that, it, you know, when I was talking about the, what you were, the question you were asking me, it's, it's courage that other people give me. You know, you might think when, at, at, that I'm giving something to them, but that most of the time I'm actually getting something from them. I mean, this woman is looking down the barrel of a life that ends when she's 30, and she's giving great advice on how to be a better human. That's what she's thinking about it. I mean, it's, incre it's, an, incredible, it's an incredible gift. Um, uh, I love this photo um, <laughs> because of his hair. This is Richard. And um, so th this is also Richard. We're in, his, we're in his backyard, and he and his wife, Amy, and I are sort of walking. He lives in this sort of beautiful old farmhouse, and we're, we're walking down to the river behind their house so he can show me the place he wants to take his picture that he really loves. And he has a moment where he, he's lost his bearing, and he doesn't know who I am. It's a flicker. It, it, it's just momentary. But as a professional, I knew that I had to take this photo because he looks angry. He looks menacing. And that expression the, and the change. And I hope I have it. I do have it. OK, so this is what Richard normally, this is Richard 99.9% .9 of the time. 
and that's his, that's his wife, Amy. So I, li I like to show that picture to sort of sh show this, this, this incredible broad spectrum of, of emotions. And you have to, you know, sometimes you have to wait, to wait for it. And I think people learn skills of new, new I, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself. You know, sometimes when you're a newbie and you don't know what you're doing and you don't know anything, you're, you feel sorry for yourself. And, you know, I was, I was scared about my relationship with my grandmother and how she's one of my favorite people in the world and how my relationship was going to change with her. And I, I had to learn how to stand aside and realize that I was the one that was going to have to change to continue a loving relationship with her. Um, that I needed to learn how she wanted to now communicate to give and receive love, to share moments of connection, we're going to have to change by her on her terms. And that, that it's a, it's hard. I, I mean, I, I, but it's, but it, but it's important. And the and you, when you meet people that do it well, it, it's helpful. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I was trying, hoping that sharing these stories would give other people who are on this journey, the courage and the strength to try to learn new ways to love and connect and to reach out to one another. Um, so um, I photographed, this is a photo, obviously um, I photographed Richard and his wife. We had an interview and um, he passed away. And about a year after his death, I reached out to Amy and I, because we, we, we got along really well, and I said, can I interview you again? Because uh, I want to talk about your, your journey and his, his death. And um, so then we had a, we, we, we talked for hours. And I just want to share a little bit about that with you. Um, Amy agreed to talk again and told me, I was, I was relieved at the diagnosis I was asking her about when she found out Richard had Alzheimer's. I was relieved at the diagnosis in a way because it explained a few things that were really upsetting me. I'm sure he knew even then he was so afraid and anxious about losing his own control, his own personness, his own identity, and that inevitably would show up in frustrations and anger. Once I knew he had dementia, I could let things go versus being angry and upset. We discussed how our experience might be helpful to others. And, and she, she paused and she said, it's so easy to lose your perspective, that loss of partnership, that camaraderie. It's, it's hard to get past. It's a difficult answer, but it jumps back to basic philosophy for me. It's accepting and appreciating whatever is in the moment. What you've got is what you've got. You didn't deal this hand. It's the hand that's on the table, and you have to decide how you're going to play it. You have to readjust your whole life on the moment, having the compassion to be empathetic with what they're growing through and not staying in your own ego. What do I want? What do I need? It's noticing and being accepting of what's happening now. It doesn't matter what happened five years ago. You don't have to think ahead. It's only about what's happening right now. It's so tempting to hold on to your ego, hold on to what you, the images of what you thought your life was gonna be like, and what you want, and what you think you deserve. It just, it just wipes you right out. Here I am at the end saying that I've learned so much. I've learned so much. I've grown in ways that I would not have grown if I hadn't been cleaned by fire. It just burnt right through me, and it was hard. But here on the other side, I have a deep peace. I've learned a lot about death and end stages. It makes me think about my own future. I'm, I'm in line, I mean, we're all gonna get there. And how do I want that to be for me? It's just a deep piece of, me of meeting each day as it is. Um, so I, I just had a, a, a couple observations, and then I'd love to, if anybody wants to ask questions or share their own experiences. Um, you know, de I think through my work, I've learned dementia doesn't discriminate. It doesn't matter what your economic power is your race, your color, or your religion, no, no one is immune. Um, I photographed every, you know, people all over the country from all different walks of life and races and eight ages. Um, I think Mike, Mike 
Belleville, one of the first people I showed you, taught me a good lesson that is if you've met somebody with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. Don't make assumptions. Everyone is different. It, it manifests differently in everyone, and people handle it totally differently. Um, you know, and the other thing is I, I think the diagnosis isn't the end. It's the beginning of the, of the next chapter, and it's often a journey that can twist and turn over, over decades. You know, we talked about the pathology of Alzheimer's can begin, you know, years and years and years before symptoms show. Um, and I think, you know, this, the, this, <laughs> the, stigma, the stigma is real, um, and people... Um, the stereotype of Alzheimer's is tragedy and despair and loss, and that's a narrow, incomplete view. Um, so I, I, I guess, again, back to my, the beginning, is I, my, my goal is to stimulate conversation, to make a difficult subject a, maybe even a tiny bit easier to talk about. You know, no, no major health or social problem has ever been solved with silence. Um, silence perpetuates the stigma, it stifles conversation, acceptance and understanding. So I'm, I'm just, uh, thank you for coming uh, and agreeing that this is something that important that we should talk about. So thanks again.